Good afternoon and good morning to uh, Rio and Mel Kelly on the West Coast. Welcome to Sasakawa Peace Foundation USA Policy Briefing Series. I am delighted to see so many people joining us today. I am Satohiro Akimoto, Chairman and the President of Sasakawa Peace Foundation USA. Sasakawa USA is a nonpartisan 501c3 organization dedicated to deepening the understanding of and strengthening the relationship between the US and Japan, mainly in the Asia Pacific context for the good of free and open international community. Before we begin the event, let me quickly go over the meeting protocol. Today's event is on the record. A recap and a video link will be posted on our website at the latter day. How to change screen views? Please manually change between speaker and gallery views. How to ask a question? Please click the raise hand button on your screen. Please unmute your microphone when you are called upon. It is my distinct pleasure to introduce our esteemed speakers today. Rear Admiral Jamie Kelly was a commander of US Naval Forces Japan from September 2005 to April 2009. He was responsible for enabling the US Navy's Seventh Fleet operation throughout the Indo-Asia Pacific theaters. He was awarded the Emperor's, Rising, Emperor's Order of the Rising Sun, Gold and the Platinum Stars for his distinct service in the US-Japan relationship. Rio Admiral Kelly has lifelong interest in the US-Japan relationship. After retiring from his 36 years of military career, he continues his involvement in the US-Japan relations. In 2018, he became the president of the John Manjiro Whitfield Commemorative Center for International Exchange, which is responsible for the annual Japan-America Grassroots Summit, one of the oldest and the largest bilateral events between Japan and the United States. He brought his trademark enthusiasm to the summit. So congratulations, uh, Rear Admiral Kelly. Rear Admiral Kelly loves Japanese culture. So I heard that he is now constructing an open air Japanese style bath at his home in Oregon. Dr. Takako Hikotani is our discussant today. Dr. Hikotani is Gerald L. Curtis Associate Professor of Modern Japanese Politics and Foreign Policy at the Columbia University. She was one of the most respected security policy experts in Japan, particularly focusing on civil military relations with comparative perspective. Before she came to Columbia, she was Associate Professor at the National Defense Academy of Japan. Rear Admiral Kelly, floor is yours. Okay, thanks Dr. Akimoto uh, for that really kind uh, inv uh, invitation and welcome uh, to this, uh, this uh, wonderful conference. Dr. Hikutani, I hope that I will uh, live up to my side of the bargain and will put on a good show for uh, everybody. Uh, can't thank people enough for uh, joining this. And I look forward as I think Dr. Hikutani does uh, to your questions uh, at the end of the thing. And uh, in the meantime, I fully recognize upfront that uh, there are many people on this net that have logged in that are much more uh, savvy and smart and informed than I am. Uh, so uh, I recognize that up front. And, uh, and I also recognize up front, uh, this thing is all about relations. Everything that I uh, will talk about today, uh, of course, is alliance focus between Japan and the US, but it's also that alliance can't do anything without the person-to-person -person relationships that go with uh, what means so much to our alliance. And uh, the first person that I saw uh, who was allowed into uh, the, the conference from the waiting room is my uh, dearest friend and uh, old, no, not old, mature battle buddy, uh, Admiral Yoji Koda. Uh, and we were counterparts uh, for many years uh, over in Japan. And some of those uh, thoughts will come out, uh, I'm sure, 
uh, as I'm talking, but I will uh, try to not bore you and I will try to talk about some things that I really think are uh, tremendously important for our relationship uh, and for the Alliance. Uh, and that's my focus. And the other piece up front that I need to mention is I have the US Naval Forces Japan uh, logo on top of most of the slides. And the reason I do that is these are not CNFJ slides anymore. Admiral Fort is now in place. Uh, these are my slides that I used to use when I was talking about our alliance and talking about things that were important, uh, not only when I was on active duty uh, in Japan uh, up through 2009, but also uh, when I taught at the US Naval War College for six years and then uh, in presentations and in uh, discussions that I've had uh, since I retired from that job uh, in 17. So it's everything that I have as a focus is based on my experience over in Japan and working as part of the US Navy's forward deployed Naval Forces uh, for a total of nine years uh, uh, over, the, over my career uh, in Japan. And then often trips back to Japan uh, as a member of the War College's uh, uh, faculty uh, as a Dean there. So that's my perspective and that's why you see that logo. So don't equate this to Admiral Fort who is CNFJ now. Uh, these are all uh, my inputs. What you see on the front is probably one of the most significant things that I was allowed to participate in. And this is the arrival of the USS George Washington CVN nuclear powered, CV carrier and for nuclear powered. And this is right outside of uh, Yokosuka Harbor uh, on the 26th of September, 2008. Yes, I remember the date very well. And this is our uh, George Washington sailors doing their best to spell out Hajime Mashte, glad to meet you, uh, as they are coming into uh, Yokosuka Harbor uh, on their arrival. And I might point out that uh, just out of the pictures uh, were uh, Kaijo Jetai, Japanese Maritime Self-Defense Force Japanese Navy, I will use that term quite often here, uh, Japanese Navy escort uh, that was done by uh, Sink SD Fleet then, uh, Commander-in-Chief of the Self-Defense Fleet, Yoji Kota, and uh, the Fleet Escort Force uh, forces uh, that escorted George Washington in. Um, this was a project that you think, okay, you just snap your fingers and you say, let's swap out the aircraft carrier. It's not that simple. In this case, we were talking about a change in culture and a change in thinking, particularly in Kanagawa Prefecture and in Yokosuka City, uh, and uh, many, many, many years of very, very hard work by thousands of people, literally thousands of people. Uh, and really, if you think about the transition from a conventionally powered aircraft carrier that we would forward deploy to Japan and work from Yokosuka, starting with USS Midway in 1973, but you're going from a conventional carrier to now a nuclear powered carrier. And of course, you have to overcome the, the mindset and the thinking, uh, which makes complete sense. In Japan, until this time, I think uh, the majority of thought was nuclear is all about nuclear weapons. It's a bad thing. And it is. It's a horrific thing. And Hiroshima and Nagasaki come up, of course, uh, in any discussion like this. This is Navy nuclear power. It's safe. It's good. And it's a very, very uh, game-changing technology uh, for our Navy as we made moves toward it. And if you think about it, the people in Japan who were working towards many things that counted for the Alliance, even way back in the 60s, they recognized when the US Navy said, we're gonna be a nuclear Navy. They said, sooner or later, we're going to have to allow nuclear powered uh, warships uh, probably into our ports. Uh, and that became very prevalent in the 70s. So when the Midway was assigned, there was no doubt in anybody's mind, if you were looking long term, 30, 40 years down the line, that sooner or later, we would probably get to nuclear powered aircraft carriers when we said these were going to be it. So very, very important thing. And uh, certainly was my uh, Navy lifelong project uh, and a very, very important event. By the way, you see those, uh, some of the boats that are out there in the harbor. Uh, there were 10 count them, 10 protest boats only uh, on the arrival of George Washington. It was nothing. Uh, you also see Japanese Coast Guard boats and uh, of course the tugs that are pushing the ship around, but it was a pretty spectacular event. Uh, and uh, we had worked so hard with the city of Yokosuka, with uh, Kaijo Jetai in particular, 
uh, with our county go governor and uh, all of his offices and the uh, U.S. Embassy, of course, led by uh, Ambassador Schieffer uh, in Tokyo and all of the defense ministry people uh, and Ministry of Foreign Affairs folks in Tokyo uh, were our partners in this, uh, in this effort of bringing George Washington uh, home. And you also might notice that George Washington is not there anymore. Ronald Reagan is, and that's a different story. So let's go to the next slide if we could, Shanti. <laughs> Uh, I won't try to tell anybody here how to suck eggs. That's a very American expression, uh, but I want to note that, yes, I'm talking about the alliance, but from my perspective, uh, this is a mostly maritime alliance. That doesn't mean the other services, the Japanese Air Force, Air Self-Defense Force, and the Ground Self-Defense Force don't count. They count tremendously. They have to be able to, we have to be able to work as an alliance with our counterparts. So the, the JG SDF must work with the U.S. Marines and with the U.S. Army. The Air Force must work with the U.S. Air Force. Uh, and of course, the Navy is the, I think, the cement that holds this alliance together because of our maritime, uh, maritime pieces. So I'm not going to go through each list. I've updated this slide just to say, hey, you can tell uh, from north to south that um, uh, Yokosuka uh, and Sasebo have the preponderance of forces, U.S. forces. Uh, and coincidentally, they also have the preponderance of Japanese Navy forces uh, as well. And we're gonna get into Atsugi a little bit because I wanna talk about Iwakuni and Iwakuni will come up later, but you, you don't see that on this slide. And that's because when I was CNFJ, we were still working on uh, the Iwakuni transition of Carrier Air Wing 5. Now we only have a debt there, a detachment. You also see a term called MLC, Master Labor Contractor. These are Japanese civilians that work on all of our bases and places, not just for the Navy. Of course, they're at Yokota Air Base uh, and uh, Kadena Air Base uh, down in Okinawa and every other place that we uh, have our, uh, our people assigned and our forces assigned uh, to work with our uh, Japan uh, ally, allied members. Uh, um, and the Japanese government picks up the tab on that. We'll talk about funding things like that later on, but it's uh, pretty important. Um, next slide, please, Shanti. I'm going to go from north to south just to give you a quick look because a picture sometimes is worth a thousand words and maybe you'd rather look at a picture than listen to me. Uh, but the important thing here about Masawa, number one location, of course, the second most important thing is joint bilateral and commercial co-use. So in other words, joint U.S. forces only. We have U.S. Navy and U.S. Air Force up there. Bilateral, of course, the Japanese Air Self-Defense Force is uh, right up there in Misawa. There's ground self-defense forces that are uh, in the area as well. And uh, we are very, very, very close. Uh, you note that the missile group is up there as well. And uh, uh, it's a pretty important base. And it is where now we deploy our uh, P-8s, uh, we don't have any P-3s left in the force from the West Coast, but P-3s are still uh, in and out of there once in a while. Uh, and uh, it's, a, it's a pretty important piece for uh, our alliance and for our work, uh, particularly on anti-submarine warfare in the Sea of Japan and keeping an eye on things that might be of interest to us from either North Korea or uh, Russia uh, up in that, uh, that neck of the woods. Uh, let's go ahead to the next slide, uh, please, Shanti. So this is the most important naval base that the United States has in the world. That's my argument. I would probably uh, butt heads with uh, the Fifth Fleet Commander in Bahrain, who thinks that the forces that are assigned over to, uh, to him uh, are uh, pretty important, and they are, don't get me wrong, but this base is key and important. This is a picture that... Uh, we took uh, of the Yokosuka base when the area next to the pier, and you can see a giant pier right in the center of that. And you can also, if you look closely, you'll see a couple of dredging ships. We were making the harbor of Yokosuka deeper because the CVN, the nuclear power carrier, requires a greater depth of water than a conventional. Uh, it might make sense uh, to you if you understand uh, the cleanliness and the purity of the water. We don't want to suck up a bunch of silt, uh, dirt, mud, whatever you want to call the bottom of the harbor. Very close work um, with the environmental people uh, in Kanagawa Prefecture and in the country. And of course, extraordinarily close work 
with uh, Mayor Kabaya at the time and Vice Mayor Weda and the City Council of Yokosuka to get the harbor dredged in time for George Washington, as well as build the new pier. You also see a big lineup of the U.S. Naval forces and the tenant commands that are assigned there. You only see a couple things from the JMSDF. Uh, that's because they're physically located on the Yokosuka base with the U.S. Navy 7th Fleet ships. Uh, and uh, what's not shown in this picture is maybe the most important thing of the whole place. And that is what is across the harbor in Uraga. And what's across the harbor in Uraga is every counterpart for the leadership of the United States Navy. All the leadership of the Kaijo Jetai is across the harbor uh, in Yokosuka proper. Uh, so the Commander 7 Fleet's uh, uh, counterpart, Sink SD Fleet, uh, also counterpart for the Pacific Fleet Commander uh, in Hawaii. Uh, and the Fleet Escort Force was my counterpart when I was CTF-70. That's the Ronald Reagan strike group now. In my days, it was the Kitty Hawk. And again, I mentioned Yoji Koto was my battle buddy for my first two years there. Comnav 4 Japan owns ownership and responsibility accountability for all of the U.S. Navy bases in Japan and for taking care of the people that are assigned there. So base support, if you think about that. Uh, but besides uh, the other forces you see listed on the U.S., uh, note that uh, the Japanese uh, submarine force commander is across the harbor. The mine force commander is across the harbor. The logistics force commander is across the harbor. That means that we can get from one building to another, one base to the other base in less than 10 minutes on most days in Yokosuka. That means that we can go face to face and talk about our issues with our counterparts. And that's so, so, so important. Um, so most important base. It's also, of course, bilateral use. Uh, and the last thing about Yokosuka <clears throat> that's important is the United Nations Commission rear base. That means that the the UNC rear, of course, is still in effect because uh, there's never been uh, uh, the absolute solution for the Korean uh, uh, fight in 50, 51, 52. Uh, and so now uh, the United Nations Commission is hosted in downtown Tokyo. Uh, and the fact that this is one of the UN's bases uh, means that we can bring in forces that were part of that uh, United Nations Commission at the end of the uh, Korean War. Uh, and that allows us to bring ships in here that are, uh, that are uh, from uh, nations that are other than Japan and the United States. Uh, go ahead, next slide, Shanti. <clears throat> Atsugi. Uh, the thing that I'll mention here is that look at the, look at the, the cities around the base. And you'll see you know, what you're looking at is uh, kind of looking toward the north. If you look at the right end of the runway, that points almost directly north and directly south, uh, of course, the lower left. But uh, here at Atsugi, the Fleet Air Force Commander for the Kaijo Jetai is located and the Fleet Air Wing is there. Uh, and we used to have uh, Carrier Air Wing 5 located here. Now there is just a detachment and the repair facility, the major repair facility for those airplanes that are uh, brought up from Iwakuni now uh, to uh, be maintained uh, by the, not only the Naval Air Pacific Repair Facility, uh, but uh, uh, the uh, Nippi uh, aircraft uh, works uh, that are on the east side of the base along with the Kaiju JTAC. So uh, HSL-51, those are helicopters, anti-submarine warfare focus. They go out on all of our Navy ships when they pull out of the harbor in Yokosuka. So that's what you got there. And it's again, a joint and bilateral use. In other words, again, joint US uh, and anybody we bring in and the bilat uh, because of course we're with our partners, our battle buddies, uh, the Japanese Kaijo Jetai uh, Fleet Air Force. Next slide, Shanti. Okay, so that picture showed you about the encroachment, if you will, of the populations of uh, the two cities uh, right around the three cities, really right around at Sugi Base. What we needed to do was think long and hard about what do we do about this noise over time? And this is another one of those efforts that is joint bilateral and at the highest levels of both of our ministries of defense, Ministry of Defense in Japan and Secretary of Defense, of course, in the US. And it gets to the prime minister and the president. We needed to move uh, and combine our forces based on a defense policy review initiative uh, to send our CAG-5 noisemakers, jets, if you will, down to Marine Corps Air Station Iwakuni, okay? 
Uh, and that's where that is located. And I'll show you a couple slides of that here uh, in pretty quick, uh, pretty quick order. Go ahead, next slide, please, Shanti. Okay, at Sugi to Iwakuni. This is the new Iwakuni. Some of you might have lost track of what's happened there. Uh, everything that is in, outlined in black are things that were done in order to support this move of the carrier air wing. And it started without the carrier air wing being involved. It started with a runway relocation program. And if you look in the very center of the, uh, the area that's outlined uh, with black and toward the water, uh, the old runway exists there, and I'll show you a little bit better picture of it now uh, on the next slide, not yet, uh, Shanti, but if you look at the lineup of the hangars, uh, the runway that did exist uh, is inside and to the west as you're looking uh, toward Otago Mountain. The triangles that you see uh, that are inland a little bit, that's a, that is what used to be Otago, A-T-A-G-O, Otago Mountain. And that was leveled over a period of almost 10 years to do the landfill uh, that produced the new runway that you're looking at in the foreground. And uh, at any rate, uh, so let's go to the next slide because this project was incredible. And it reflects, again, the, the thought the longevity and the goodness of our alliance. And when people say we can't get anything done, they're absolutely wrong. We can get tremendous things done. Look at the timeline down here. So you see again, the map, just looking at the picture, the previous runway and the current runway. Uh, you see where Otago Mountain was. You see that all of that uh, rock and dirt that uh, used to go with that mountain, that was barged five miles over to do the landfill for the current runway. That project started in 1971. And if you look at that timeline, lower right-hand box corner, didn't finish really until 2020. That's last time I checked 50 years, okay? Is that fast enough? No, but more on that later. But what I'm saying is, hey, this was a tremendously expensive project, mostly funded by the government of Japan. You can see uh, the dollar value uh, up uh, for the runway relocation project, and that had to come first. That was something that was worked out long, long ago uh, between the two countries. And then about in the mid uh, 2000s, because uh, I was involved in some of these discussions, uh, we held the Defense Policy Review Initiative. Again, I know that there's many people in Washington, D.C. area that were involved directly in that. Uh, and uh, we talked about a lot of things of how to improve the alliance for the good for the future. And part of that was moving the noisemakers out of Atsugi as a primary location and bringing them down where we moved the existing runway uh, to the current runway uh, one kilometer to the, to the east. So that's a, that's a pretty good distance and boy, does it make a difference on noise. Uh, so you see the timeline, you see the other things that moved with it, the costs involved, pretty incredible. And when you say, number one, if uh, the, our old administration wanted to say, well, the Japanese aren't paying enough. Well, they sure did pay enough here and uh, we paid enough too. So this says we can really do big projects together. That's what this slide says. Let's go to the next one, Shanti. Okay, Fleet Activity Sasebo, most strategic base that we've got in the, in the world. Uh, Admiral Togo, long ago, was very, very smart to move the Japanese fleet to this location. Uh, and obviously, it paid off in the Battle of Tsushima Straits and uh, in uh, uh, warfare with the Russians and, uh, and subsequent to that. So that was a long time ago, place far, far away. Now we've got uh, uh, the... Uh, Sasebo District Commander, three-star. Uh, that was, again, Admiral Koda's job uh, when we were counterparts uh, when I was CNFJ. And, uh, uh, and then he came back to Sink SD Fleet. Uh, but, uh, and, and you see the center pier there area looks like a lot of bare dirt. And that's because this was a picture from my time when the new pier area for the Kaijo Jetai was being built, as well as for uh, some of the US ships. Uh, and we keep our most, uh, one thing I didn't mention is of course, from a U.S. Navy perspective, we put our our newest, uh, our most uh, 
capable uh, gear and people forward uh, here to support the alliance with Japan and to support our other allies in the regions, particularly the ROCs, the, the Republic of Korea, uh, but uh, also to uh, uh, to be able to be a counter uh, to the things that are going on uh, with the neighbor to the direct west of Japan. But you can see the other pieces of the base here. Very, very, very important. And this most strategic of the locations, particularly because of the East China Sea, South China Sea uh, issues that are going on now, not just Sea of Japan and not just uh, the Korean Peninsula. Next slide, please, Shanti. Okay, now, okay, a couple of places down there. Uh, number one, we got Kadena Air Base. That's on the right, of course. And that, again, is joint, okay? Because uh, it's U.S. Navy, U.S. Air Force. It's also bilateral with the JASDEF in there working with us all the time. And then we have a White Beach uh, that is out to the east side of Kadena Air Base. And that's where we bring the amphibious ships that are located in Sasebo down to get on those big long piers. Uh, and that's where we load aboard all of our U.S. Marines that are mostly assigned in the Futenma area. Uh, we load them onto our amphibious ships and we go out and do our naval, uh, our naval business. So uh, really strategic location and key to the entire alliance and to certainly uh, our U.S. commitments uh, from the Navy's perspective, 7th Fleet and the 3rd uh, Marine Expeditionary Forces perspective uh, here in Japan. Again, uh, I can't stress it enough, the UNC rear base, of course, uh, and then joint and bilateral use. So that's what you got down there at uh, Okinawa. Uh, let's go to the next one, Shanti. All right couple of thoughts to hopefully get your competitive juices uh, flowing and uh, maybe generate some questions when uh, Dr. Kitani uh, 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 takes uh, over after uh, me and, uh, and uh, will help educate the group here. Uh, but I just wanted to give you a few personal thoughts. And again, these are, these are my personal thoughts. They're not U.S. Navy policy by any means. I'm a retired guy. So uh, i just give you a couple of thoughts. Uh, everybody wonders always when there's changes of min administrations. Uh, we wondered it when uh, Prime Minister Suga uh, took over for Prime Minister Abe, what would happen? Well, not much has changed. The policies are the same. We also wonder what will change with President Biden from President Trump. I think that what we'll have is a much more civil dialogue. Again, this is my personal opinion. That's all it is. Uh, I think that uh, we have a pretty savvy leader in the United States of America this day, and I'm uh, very, uh, very pleased uh, by it. I think that uh, the policies that we've had going will probably continue uh, and they'll continue in good order. What I hope uh, for sure is that uh, President Biden puts a focus on the alliance between Japan and the U.S. because I think it's very, very, very key, particularly right now. Uh, I think that uh, that impact uh, maybe is already felt. Uh, I was really uh, pleased to see that uh, Defense Minister Kishi and uh, General Austin, our new Secretary of Defense, uh, had a chat yesterday where they talked about uh, the continued effort to get Futenma Air Base uh, closed down on the southern part of Okinawa and moved up to uh, the northern part of, uh, uh, of the Okinawa uh, area. Um, I think that was very important. And also the two agreed uh, really completely on just keeping the focus on the alliance and uh, keeping this thing going. I wanna see us put more of a focus on the alliance. I hope that President Biden and his advisors will come very quickly to a decision on who should be the ambassador from the United States of America to Japan and get that person in place. That can be, in my mind, the most important signal that our new president sends uh, not only to Japan, but to the other people that are uh, out in that part of the world. So enough on that. For structure, we've got to increase where it's possible. Uh, that's a period down under line. I think that uh, U.S. Navy has done a pretty good job. Admiral Gil Day is our CNO. Uh, he's making sure that we send our best forces forward. Uh, and that has uh, continued uh, from the days when uh, John Greenert, who is on this uh, line, Admiral Greenert was our chief of naval operations and uh, many people before him. So uh, thanks Admiral Greenert for joining us. Uh, we've got to increase the forces where possible. And that's not just the, that's not just the U.S. forces. I'm going to talk about the, the Navy here in a second in Japan with the missile defense. But I also wanted to say, hey, Nagashima, uh, that's controversial right now. 
Nagashima is located southwest of uh, Kyushu and a uh, pretty important uh, project that we've got going. We need to do it faster than we're talking about doing it. What we're looking at at Magashima is not only building a uh, Japanese maritime self-defense force uh, uh, runway base uh, and place where we might base anti-submarine warfare type of aircraft uh, out of, uh, it might even work for the JASDF. It might work for the U.S. Air Force, but we need to have a place that we can do carrier landing practice for the carrier Air Wing 5 folks that is not as distant as Iwo, to, Iwo Jima in the U.S. terms. Uh, Iwo Jima from Atsugi was 675 nautical miles. From Iwakuni, it's 750 nautical miles. That's too far with nothing to land on in between, unless you happen to have an aircraft carrier out there, uh, and we don't uh, often between the two places. So we need to get the Magashima project moving, and we need to build it faster and better and get it going. Uh, and that also will impact our force readiness in the East China Sea, uh, which is significantly needed. So next subject, missile defense. A lot of controversy over the last couple of years about what are we gonna do? Are we gonna shore base Aegis uh, ballistic missile defense systems or are we gonna put them out to sea? Uh, now the decision has been made uh, to put them out to sea with the Kaijo Jetai. That is really, really great because we all know that uh, a fixed base is easily targeted or certainly much easier targeted than a movable object is. And that's the whole idea behind having a couple new Aegis ships um, for the Japanese Maritime Self-Defense Force, AKA the Japanese Navy. Now we got to man it. Uh, the Navy is worried about, okay, can we come up with 500 sailors to man? This gets into a really deep and difficult Navy subject, uh, but you know, what does Jamie Kelly think about uh, the Alliance and the forces uh, that are serving in the military uh, in Japan? And I think that uh, we need to take a real hard look together, but Japan in particular, because it's the Japanese forces that we're talking about. We need to make it a little more uh, sustainable career-wise, uh, maybe increased salaries. We have got to pour money into our training together. The two navies, don't get me wrong, our two navies are the closest navies in the world, in the world. And the things that we do between the Seventh Fleet ships and the uh, Japanese Navy ships are extraordinary and incredible and leading edge. We need to do the same things with the U.S. Air Force and the JASDF, with the U.S. Ground Self-Defense Forces and the Marines uh, and the Army. And we've got to start working on it now. That's because of the next issue, the PRC and the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, I certainly personally believe that uh, the CCP is an ex 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 existential threat to the United States of America and to Japan. Uh, CCP is doing everything they can to split our alliance. They also want to split our alliance with the Republic of Korea. Uh, but this uh, Japan-US alliance is the most important thing in the world that we've got right now. And particularly with the focus that the Chinese have on the East China Sea and the South China Sea. Illegal land grabs certainly down in the South China Sea trying to take ownership of the area known as the cow's tongue. Uh, and that means that uh, the US Navy and the Japanese Navy need to be operating together in those areas all the time. There's also one heck of a lot of uh, potential for a dust up uh, because we've got Coast Guards from both countries uh, all three countries, really, because our U.S. Coast Guard is there once in a while. But the Japanese Coast Guard and the Chinese Coast Guard, we've got the Gray Navies uh, both involved. And we've got fishing fleet uh, that are armed from the Chinese that are involved around the Senkakus and then around some of the places in the South China Sea. That means we've got to be on our game. The Quad, U.S., Japan, Australia, and India. Improvements there are tremendous. They're working very well. We need to keep the press on and bring, uh, bring the four countries, keep them together all the time and bring India's uh, efforts uh, into, our, uh, into our relationship. Russia and the North Koreans. Well, North Korean missile defense or missile, bleh, excuse me, ballistic missile uh, piece is not gonna go away. Uh, so we need to keep our eyes on that. Hence the Aegis uh, missile defense piece for the JMSDF. And the Russians are up to no good. All you have to do is look at the cyber attacks on the United States of America uh, over the last year and you see what they're up to. Uh, by the way, Chinese are up to the same thing. The last piece is the forward basing and the personal relationships. We have to keep the focus on our forward basing. We will, 
I'm confident of that in General Austin and uh, our uh, Defense uh, Department and President Biden to work that. And I'll talk more on personal relationships when I get a chance. Uh, and I hope I've triggered some questions that'll follow uh, Dr. Ikitani. Thank you very much for listening. Maria de Kelly, thank you very much for your comprehensive uh, uh, overview, as well as uh, analysis of a uh, 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 concrete example of your Japan uh, uh, cooperation uh, in terms of uh, 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 national security. Uh, also, uh, thank you very much for presenting your personal views on the current uh, 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 security, security issues and threats uh, uh, surrounding Japan and uh, uh, direct uh, existential threat to uh, uh, our US-Japan uh, relationship. So thank you very much. Uh, before uh, we move on to uh, 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 Dr. Hikotani, I just wanted to say a, a quick word to uh, uh, Admiral Koda. Uh, thank you very much for joining uh, from Tokyo. And uh, uh, if you uh, like to uh, make a comment or questions, uh, uh, you will be the uh, lead of uh, hitter. But this is not to force you to uh, stay up till uh, 3 a.m. in Tokyo. So uh, feel free to uh, go, go to bed if you need to. But thank you very much and I really appreciate it. And also it's an honor to uh, have you uh, in the event. So thank you very much. So Dr. Hikotani, uh, floor is yours. Um, thank you very much, um, um, Dr. Akimoto. And thank you so much, uh, Rear Admiral Ke Ke Kelly for your presentation. Um, my name is Takako Hikotani. It is a, really a great honor for me to participate in this very important event. Um, as was included in the kind introduction, I taught at the National Defense Academy from 1999 to 2016. And um, being in Yokosuka, I never thought that I have the honor of meeting with um, the commander of the US Naval Forces Japan in this kind of setting. So although I'm very proud of our mutual background in Yokosuka, I just wanna say that I'm just totally honored to be here. I'm also very honored to be in this event, um, knowing that there's so many distinguished um, mem people in the audience that I started, I stopped looking at because it's just making me more nervous, but I hope I can add some comments and ask some questions to um, the wonderful presentation we just heard um, to bring the discussion to everybody in the audience as well. Um, just a little plug about um, my previous um, job at the National Defense Academy to add on to the personal relationships, that's very important. Um, in case you're not familiar, the National Defense Academy is a um, tri-service academy. And just to point out the international aspects of it, about 100 of this 2,000 cadets are actually international students. And about 40 cadets go over to study abroad every year on an exchange program. And there's exchange students at the um, service academies in the US. Um, and there, um, there's also instructors uh, from Japan, self-defense officers teaching at these service academies. Um, and beyond the National Defense Academy, I'm very proud to say that my former students have been, um, has been actively um, working at the forefront of defense diplomacy, either in the National Security Secretariat um, and in other um, parts of MOD, and that um, there's graduate students at Columbia and Georgetown from the Navy, and that, um, and also not just in um, the US, but other countries, such as um, my former, former, two of my former students are currently, one is a defense attache, and one is a student at the Command and Staff College at ROK. So this is just to show how um, the personal part is actually much more international and deep than you might think. Um, but um, I'd like to move on to my comments and questions. And I'm gonna be selfish here that it's gonna reflect my current interest, academic interest, as well as the class that I'm teaching. Um, I have three points. Uh, one is about the military to military relations and its impact on the diplomatic relationships between the two countries. Second is about basis. And the third is about US relations with Asia, which is the class that I'm teaching at Columbia right now. Um, first about the military to military relationship. Um, um, the close relationship between the US and Japan, especially at the Navy level is very well known. Um, I still remember reading and very being impressed by uh, Dr. Agawa's book, Umi no Yujo, The Friend Friendship of the Seas, about the history of the naval to Navy relationship. And also a former student of mine, um, actually the one who's at in Korea, ROK um, Staff College, went to look at 
um, the Naval War College proceedings um, from the immediate post-war era and was impressed to see the level of interest and exchange at the academic level among the Navy officers at that kind of an academic setting. So I'm very uh, aware of the close relationship, especially at the Navy level. And I think it has um, three or perhaps four aspects to its impact in the civil military relations in Japan. One is the shared learning. So uh, one is learning um, in terms of the shared world of views, especially on the vision of the world order, the rule of law, and possibly um, the role in society and professionalism. I think that's the learning process that takes place at the military level. Saying it is possibly legitimacy and as a common good to the region, maybe as a, it's, I've been told that it has worked sort of as a passport to the region that might've been more skeptical about Japan's influence. Third is linkage. Um, the Japan has, um, as I mentioned, the NDA is joint, but jointness has been an ongoing process in Japan, and I know that it has been inspired and somewhat functionally, it makes sense because of the jointness of the US. And finally, this is a more controversial point that in some cases it works as leverage vis-a-vis -vis a, a civilian or political level within, uh, within each country. Um, so my question to you, Ad um, Admiral Carey, is like looking forward, the topic of today's talk is charting a shared course. Um, and that I know that the relationship at the military level is very close, but what, from based on experience, what do you see going forward to be the important things that should be tackled or discussed at the political level and not to be complacent about the favorable relationship that takes place at the working level between the two countries. So that's that. Um, the second question is about basis. Uh, when I teach, I teach Japanese politics in the fall and U.S. policy with Asia in the spring, but when I talk about the U.S.-Japan alliance in the context of Japanese politics, I always focus on the base issue because I think, as you mentioned, um, not just that the U.S.-Japan alliance is mostly about maritime, it's very hard not to ignore the political aspect of basis and the fact that that is a very important source of stability, but also a source of controversy. Um, and you, your experience includes the very um, important yet uh, very successful case of the George Washington. I remember in 2008 about the George Washington um, being based in Yokosuka. I was somewhat surprised being a faculty member who teaches political science nearby that there wasn't as much controversy as I thought. And I also um, would like to, to point out that I didn't realize um, until I, I, I watched your um, event the other day, that the, um, there, it's not a coincidence that the Navy burger became a popular item in the towns of Yokosuka around the same time that Georgetown, uh, George Washington was faced. I'm also very appreciative of your um, discussion of the Iwakuni base, because I think that's actually relatively unknown, but very important thinking about um, the relationship and your role in that. But having said that, I've recently worked on a, uh, what's called a survey experiment. That's a new way of doing surveys in Japan in a joint paper with two other professors and found that based on our survey experiment, when you ask questions about bases in areas in Okinawa and, and, and also other parts of Japan, although the good news is that um, the respondents generally have a very favorable image of the US and also of their alliance relationship, that does not, necessarily translate to acceptance of having bases in their backyard. That is that um, although the personal exchange and the economic compensation that results to the community is overwhelming, that does not really necessarily translate to having a welcoming attitude. And the other interesting twist that we found is that um, people are more receptive of having the self-defense forces have the same type of military a battery in their backyard than the US forces for various reasons, which we thought was very interesting. So as you mentioned, the Magashima is a very interesting case. And also with the elections coming up with the mayor election of the neighboring island in January 31st, I think there's gonna be a lot of focus given that the incumbent is actually opposed to the ongoing plan. Um, and you mentioned the jointness and the bilateral nature and in Misawa's case, the, also the commercial nature. What do you think are, based on experience, the way to make the basing relationship 
palatable and also constructive going forward? And what are the ways in which you suggest might be some ways to move um, the political discussion forward in the other uh, more difficult case of Okinawa? Finally, is um, I'm going to be selfish and ask a question that I think my students in my US policy with East Asia class, which I'm teaching this evening, will be interested in is about the multilateral aspect of the US-Japan alliance. And that has to do with the, um, working with other partners in the region. I, from what we've read and also heard um, in the past week with the uh, Biden administration, I think there's clearly an emphasis on alliances and possibly more emphasis on more alliances working together, not just the US Japan, but including other countries. And I think already in the Indo-Pacific, we see other countries being interested in being partners in the region. We see more European countries such as the UK and Germany deploying their ships to the area. But um, I guess my question to you is, what do you think about the future of or the shared course going forward about inclusion of other countries in a quad type arrangement or like how, how much emphasis and I'm asking most uh, I'm, I'm curious to know especially about what we think about ROK as I mentioned in my initial comment I think that the military to military relationship between Japan and ROK has been actually the source of stability or more constant and the uh, and otherwise very volatile relationship between the countries. But I am also worried that there might be some differences in both interests and the way forward, especially because there might be changes coming the US side too with the administration going forward. So what do you think about the future of the region and not just the Quad, but other countries and other partners in the US and what kind of role the US can play and maybe bringing the partner countries together going forward in the area. So that's those are my comments. And thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you very much, Dr. Hikotani, uh, uh, Rear Admiral Kelly. Well, great questions and great issues. Thanks, Dr. Hikotani. Uh, I really appreciate your comments uh, and, and make uh, not only me do some deep thinking on some things, uh, but uh, also, I'm sure other people that are uh, that are on the line here um, uh, to think about things. Uh, great statements, though, and I uh, uh, and I think you reflect uh, the key questions that really have to uh, have to be uh, answered uh, here. Let's get to your questions. You know, number one, the shared course uh, and the politics. Uh, I think let's. I'm going to try to take them in order. I was writing as fast as I could, but uh, we'll see how I do. And if I get invited to attend your class in the future, I would hope so. Um, the the politics. Oftentimes, I think that we we like to say it's just too hard to move forward, and that's a really trite statement. It's not too hard if you want to make things happen. Uh, I think that's what we've done. Uh, in many, many cases uh, over time. I know that uh, uh, over the years, let's take the Iwakuni runway replacement. It was very slow going to start with. And that's because there was a lot of opposition to do it. It's like, oh, you know, the more we think about this, the more we're going to have, uh, you know, those Americans, those Gaijin's gonna be staying over here forever and ever. Well, uh, if we stay over here forever and ever, it will be certainly for the benefit of both uh, nations. Uh, and I hope that it is true. Uh, I know that I know where my head and my heart are, and uh, they're half in Japan all the time uh, from my years there and my wife's there. So uh, we want to say that it's too hard, that politics are too hard, particularly when you talk about Okinawa. I'll get to that in a second. But we got to drive through those things. We got to say, hey, this is too important to our nations. When I say that I believe that the, uh, the Chinese Communist Party is trying to drive that wedge between the nations, it's, it's so obvious, glaringly obvious to me that that is, uh, that is in fact the case. If they can split us, they're going to do that. If they can split us in the in the rocks. They're going to do that, uh, and uh, and and we 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 can't say, well, it's too hard to keep it going, because it's not too hard to keep it going. It just takes a shared shared values that we have as two nations: uh, democracy, freedom of speech, freedom of thought, uh, the the willingness to do things together. Uh, that's our business. It's not anybody else's business, and we can do it. Uh, and we've just got to say, hey, we have to have the political will in both countries 
to press the envelope here and recognize that uh, we've got to stick together and we've got to share that course uh, going together and going forward. Again, I use the two navies model. Uh, it's, it's not perfect, nothing ever is, but it works all the time. It's always in play. We got to show it every chance we get. When a Kaijo J. Tai destroyer goes out to sea, it shouldn't go by itself. There ought to be an American counterpart Navy ship with it. Uh, same thing should happen when the JASDEF is doing a, a, an exercise of their own. The US Air Force should be with them and vice versa. Uh, and it doesn't matter whether we're exercising uh, out of Kadena Air Base or up in Misawa. Uh, or down in Guam, uh, we should be sharing those, uh, those training spaces, which we do, uh, but we've got to ratchet those things up so that every time that we have a chance to show our alliance in action, we show it, a, we show it together, not just as an independent US Navy or an independent Japanese Navy, we show it as the partners that we, that we are. It's really, really critical. The bases, yep. Plenty of controversy and thanks for the reminder on the Navy burger. I almost got fat on those things. Uh, but, uh, you know, the honest truth is we needed to have something to highlight the partnership in Yokosuka and Sasebo. A lot of great ideas came out of Sasebo. And if you've ever been there, you notice that they have the Sasa burger, which is a real gut bomb, uh, I will admit. I think the Yokosuka burger much more healthy and Mayor Kabaya and I and uh, others uh, that were uh, inventing that uh, thing. Uh, we used the Navy recipe and uh, that was just a good uh, uh, public event and uh, brought the communities uh, closer and closer together. That's the key thing on these bases is bringing the communities closer and closer together. Um, so often because the cultures of our two countries are so different, we get American sailors that are first timers over to Japan. You know, might be Yokosuka, might be Sasebo, it doesn't matter where it is. And they will be very shy and they will not want to leave the base. They'll want to stay in the, in the cave, if you will, uh, you know, of, uh, of American food and American uh, 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 recreation facilities and their, of course, their assignments. And, and they won't want to venture out because they say, well, I don't know Japanese. Well, you got to step out there and you got to go for it. So the leadership of our forces, and it doesn't, I'm not, I'm talking Navy, of course, but it doesn't matter, Air Force, Army, and Marine Corps. Um, we've got to have people that are willing to push their people to get out and engage in the communities. There's nothing more important nothing more important than engagement with the communities that are involved. One of the things that uh, I'll try to make this a short story, but that was involved and so key to the Yokosuka uh, hosting of the George Washington and to bringing uh, that ship into the harbor uh, without very much, a lot of fanfare, but without the kind of protests that we had, let's say the first time that the USS Enterprise um, went into the port in Sasebo. Some 30,000 protesters out, Molotov cocktails, you know, injuries. It was, it was nasty. Uh, not so with GW, and that's because we worked so hard on it. Uh, but where was I going with this? I had problems with discussing the safety issues of the nuclear, Navy nuclear power, ship power versus Navy nuclear weapons, which we don't have, didn't have. At any rate, uh, and, and it's a, hey, you know, I can't get through. I can't get through. This stuff is safe. How do I do this? Well, I was out with some friends for dinner with my wife one night in Yokosuka. I won't name the family because uh, I didn't ask them if I could. But uh, they said, how you doing on this? I said, I can't seem to make the, the, the leap with the city of Yokosuka and the different, uh, the honchos of the, you know, the various areas uh, around the city, the 10 parts that make it up. And, uh, and the gentleman's wife, who is a greatest person in the world, she saved me. She says, well, why don't you, why don't you go out and have you ever thought about talking to the Seroptimus? And I said, I didn't know what a Seroptimus was. I thought it maybe was a singer. No, the Seroptimus are the women leaders of uh, the towns uh, that exist in Yokosuka in this case. And I, I said, well, uh, she says, hey, we're no different than you guys. The women run the show here and uh, we are in charge of their families. And if you can convince the, the leaders of the families that this thing is safe, then you're going to have won the battle. And essentially were her words. 
And I said, well, would you happen to know anybody who's a seroptimist? And she says, well, I happen to be the president of the seroptimist association of Yokosuka. So automatically I was uh, allowed to go speak. And that was the thing that tipped the, tipped the thing in Yokosuka. It was all about community engagement. So that's what we have to do. We have to keep it up at Iwakuni. Um, uh, Mayor Fukuda in the Iwakuni city, he is a dear friend of mine, truly. I met him when he was on his, one of Koizumi's kids signed to the diet uh, on his first election. And he ran, ran for office in Iwakuni, particularly in favor of bringing carrier air wing five fixed wing jets down to Iwakuni. That was almost his sole thing. And to say, let's engage. This will be good for business in Yamaguchi Prefecture, good for the town, yada, yada. And, uh, and that worked. He ran solely on that. And he defeated the person who was ahead of him as the mayor of the town uh, substantially. And of course, has been reelected again since. Uh, and it was because he was saying, hey, this is a good thing. And we can prove to you it's a good thing. I've seen it in action up in Kanagawa Prefecture. You're going to see it here in Yamaguchi Prefecture. It's that kind of a thing that goes. The contracts, of course, the business, uh, billions and billions of dollars. I didn't get into that. But each of the bases has got those contracts going with the communities. And they're significant significant, significant input. Uh, Yokosuka, well, each of the communities, the navies are the biggest uh, input into those communities. Uh, and down in Kadena, it's a joint, you know, it's the Air Forces and the, and the U.S. Navy uh, part. So it all goes. Uh, and the election uh, in Magashima, yep, Roger, oftentimes people are not welcoming, but uh, we've got to step out. The people that support the alliance have got to step out and take, you know, and get in front of the microphones and talk about the goodness of this alliance and why these things are so important to us and why we need to host bases. It's not a burden. People want to say it's a burden in Japan. It's not a burden. It's of economic value. It's of tremendous cultural value. Getting to know people, Japanese people getting to know Americans, Americans getting to know Japanese and to appreciate uh, the differences in our culture, but appreciate the, the similarities that go with what's in our hearts and what's in our heads and what we believe. That's what's important. And that's what will win the election in the Magashima uh, issue uh, down there. Uh, the construction going forward, especially in Okinawa, it's the same thing. This is easy for me to say because I am not a Japanese politician in Okinawa. I used to be an American politician, uh, you know, in Okinawa, but that didn't really matter. But I would say to the then governor and the then mayors, I'd say, you, you have such a good deal here with the American support. And you, you play the fiddle and you say, we must have support from Tokyo. And Tokyo pours literally billions of dollars of uh, hosting money into the Okinawa communities every year. And without that money, those communities would not be very happy. I'm not saying this is about money. It's not. But it's about the government, central government in Tokyo saying, hey, Okinawa, enough of this. We have strategic needs here. The strategic needs mean that the Marines are going to stay. The U.S. Navy is going to stay. The U.S. Air Force are going to stay. We're going to change their locations. But if you really look at the, the new uh, runway uh, and the plan that's being built for uh, northern uh, Okinawa to replace a 10,000 foot runway at Futenma, you don't replace a 10,000 foot fixed wing, uh, you know, runway uh, with a couple of 4,000 foot runways. That makes it helicopters only. Uh, and in the strategic, the strategic pulse point that we are at right now, particularly with China, uh, that's not the time to back off. Uh, so uh, we've got to we've got to do this, and we've got to work together and stick together. The last piece is on the multilateralism and the uh, the alliances, the expansion, if you will, of the alliance. Uh, I don't think you know we've been working on our alliance forever, right? I mean, all of our lives. Everybody who's on this video, it's been part of our, part of our our blood since we were born. Um, that's not going to change. And the same thing goes with the alliance with uh, the rocks, the Republic of Korea. We recognize how important that is. Oftentimes, uh, there's a little bit of head knocking between the ROK and Japan, and that's because of the historical issues. That is never going to go away. That's where the Americans come in, and we try to bring people together and keep them working together. Mm, I won't pin anybody on the spot, but I'll say, take a look at uh, how the navies, the rock navy, 
uh, and, uh, and the Japanese Navy and the US Navy are trying to work together, particularly on things like missile defense. And you'll see the model of what it's gotta be and the model's gotta go to the Air Force too. Uh, just because there is a, uh, a line in the water when you come between uh, the Korean Peninsula and Japan, it doesn't mean that the shared picture has to stop right there or the shared feelings, uh, they are together. We have, uh, we Americans in the rocks have fought together and bled together. Uh, and that means an awful lot, it means an awful lot. And that's not gonna go away. Uh, we need to pull the Japanese uh, more into that relationship than they have traditionally been willing to do. And uh, you know more on that later, I won't beat a dead horse uh, on it. Uh, the Indians, uh, very important that they're aligned. And you know, when you get to the, the pulling in more uh, of a multilateral focus into the area, I think it's obvious other nations recognize what the CCP and the People's Republic of China is doing. Nothing against the Chinese people, but the CCP and what they're trying to do with the takeover of a place that has to be free for all nations to navigate through the South China Sea. Uh, the East China Sea issue with the Senkakus, it's, it's a no brainer. It's uh, gotta be solved by the world court or nobody else. And in the meantime, Japan has got it. That was reconfirmed the other day between uh, uh, Minister uh, Kishi and Secretary of Defense um, and, uh, you know, said, yeah, it, it applies. Japan owns the Senkakus as far as we're concerned. Uh, but the more multilateral, the UK, the Germans, everybody else with shared interests, democratic values, free trade, and freedom of navigation, the more we can bring those nations in. And India obviously is part of that, Singapore is part of that, all the Southeast Asian nations, uh, the, better, the better we are uh, off working together. If China sees a united front, particularly in the South China Sea and in the areas surrounding their land mass, they will back off, but they won't do it if they don't see a united front. And so that's my pitch there is we've got to have this thing working together and we've got to stick together. I hope those Thanks. answered your question. And, uh, well, thank you very I much. I turn for... it back over to you for comebacks, Dr. Kitani, and, uh, and then maybe back uh, to Dr. Okimoto. Well, thank you very much. Uh, time is uh, uh, a little bit uh, limited, but uh, uh, Dr. Hikotani, would you like to respond very quickly or are you okay? I'm fine. I, I think, yes, it will be better. So, uh, 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 I would like to ask uh, Admiral Koda whether you'd like to make a comment. Uh, it's 3 a.m. in Tokyo, and uh, I don't mean to put you in the spot. But... No, no, I don't want to use very limited time for just for myself. So the this uh, the time window is open for everybody. That's it. But thank you very much. And Jamie, you did a great job. That's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Admiral Koda. You have a special relationship with uh, Rear Admiral Kelly. Uh, uh, it's not just a personal, but uh, it's uh, 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 rooted uh, uh, strongly in the institutional arrangement between the two countries. So thank you very much for your service. Uh, Chip, uh, 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 General Gregson, uh, uh, you have a question. He may, might have been gone, but uh, uh, so if I may read his question, why do we still have a separate basis? Iwakuni and others are a great example of how uh, this works better. I, I, I couldn't agree more with General Gregson. Um, shared bases is the way to go, period, dot, underline. Uh, the more uh, mixed basket we have on every one of our bases uh, between uh, Japanese and Americans, that is the better thing. It's clearly better too for the community that Dr. Hikutan brought up uh, in her uh, remarks in question. Uh, and it uh, makes a heck of a lot of sense. Uh, the Iwakuni thing is a, a terrific deal. And uh, although General Gregson is not here, some people that can influence those policies uh, are here. And I think that the one thing we need uh, in Iwakuni is to have a, a joint command structure for the US uh, side of the house. Right now it's all Marine Corps leadership uh, makes all the calls for the base. And it seems to me that uh, uh, if the commanding officer of that base is a Marine, the executive officer should be a sailor. And uh, then it ought to change, uh, you know, each time. And all of the key jobs uh, on those bases should go. That said, uh, yeah, I, I'm with uh, General Gregson's thought. 
thoughts uh, and his experience uh, drives it uh, the same way that I think uh, we've got to be as joint and combined as we can in every one of those bases and don't play we own the turf. That's the worst thing we can do because we don't. We, U.S., we don't. We borrow property. <laughs> and it's great for the alliance. Thank you very much. Dr. Hikotani, would you like to say a word on that? Um, yes, as I mentioned in our research, we did find that um, possibly a lighter footprint in some ways, and maybe joint use of um, basis might be the way to go. I think the caveat here is how to go about planning that, because recently there has been coverage in Okinawa newspapers about the possible joint use or joint exercise done in Honoko. And if there is an image of some secret arrangement or sort of a negative pitch to the close relationship between the two forces and talking about the possibility of the joint use, it can backfire. So of course things, to some extent, some things need to be not open from the forefront, but I think um, transparency for the sake of political legitimacy thereafter and the more positive outputs of why a joint use is necessary, not just the um, community relations, but for the, for the alliance itself, the practical reason had to be in the forefront, because I think more often than not, there might be people who think it's a good idea from operational point of view, and that the, um, the general public might be more understanding if the more positive aspects of a joint use of base could be a little bit more explained further. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have another question actually from uh, uh, General Gregson. Uh, we are in an era of rapidly developing technologies that can provide great advantage. Can you uh, 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 talk about a shared course to quickly adapt in an effective and affordable way technologies such as artificial intelligence and autonomy? Wow, that's, that's a, a billion dollar question. Yeah, <laughs> so, so you know, once again, General Gregson, he's, he's spot on. Uh, we have got to take advantage of our uh, of our technical capabilities. I know that, that that's the of course, uh, and we've got to bring them on together. Um, there is no reason other than making sure that we're both comfortable with our security apparatus uh, apparati uh, that we shouldn't be absolutely in each other's nets networks. Right? Uh, we. We must. I go back to Yoji Koda and my experience, uh, and uh, I think Admiral Greenert was the Seventh Fleet Commander when we did this. Um, we there's a there's an out, uh, there's a type of radio system, uh, communication system called Centrix uh, that we use in the navies, and uh, and here it was uh, in the 2005 time frame, and that was the first time that we had. Centrics installed on both ships so that our ships could talk directly to each other. And Yoji and I uh, were able to, you know, get on the radio from our combat system uh, places on our ships and say hello to each other and talk about operations. Well, that was that was like Stone Age technology. We need to elevate this whole thing. We absolutely have got to we've got to share on the space uh, technology, the satellite technology. All of our uh, radios, doesn't matter, UHF, VHF, all of the frequency spectrum entitled uh, that, uh, that goes, and we've got to link them up together. All of our underwater systems have to be linked together, and uh, we've got to get to it. That's what an alliance is all about. It's about sharing. Uh, it's not just about sharing the thoughts. It's about sharing the costs and the technologies and the things that we're learning and that we're working together. So it's really, really uh, key. And again, General Gregson is spot on on that. Uh, anything we can um, uh, is going to help us out. Over. There is uh, somebody joining from India and uh, uh, he's interested in uh, a strong relationship or becoming a, a strong relationship between the Indian Navy and the U.S. Navy. Uh, as you know, uh, uh, better than anybody else, the uh, relationship becoming uh, closer, closer, and operational. How does the uh, 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 that relationship uh, 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 comes into uh, our U.S.-Japan relationship in the big uh, 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 in the Pacific uh, uh, region? Uh, well, sir, uh, that's a great question, and it all starts at the top. The uh, Chief of Naval Operations in India and the Chief of Naval Operations in the United States uh, they need to be talking. Uh, and they need to be talking uh, often. Uh, 
uh, if we're going to grow this relationship. I think that in this case as well, they should include discussions. If the quad is going to succeed, and there's a lot of hope in the, the quad, but then we need to bring in the chief of naval operations equivalent from Australia, and of course, uh, sink SD fleet. Uh, if not, uh, if not the uh, uh, the Japanese uh, 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 chief of the maritime staff, uh, both of those people need to be involved. So that's the way we do this thing. Uh, and then it goes to the fleet level. So the fleet commander for India has got to be in sync with not only our uh, Pacific Fleet Commander, uh, Admiral Aquilino in, uh, in uh, Hawaii, but more importantly, I think, it's got to be in sync with the uh, 7th Fleet Commander uh, in Yokosuka, Bill Mertz. Uh, and uh, if they can get together, there's, it's all about those personal relationships. If the personal relationships are working, there's nothing that can't be done. It's just in everybody's imagination and in their will and their, and their thinking. So um, think like Yoji Koda and I did, and uh, and uh, John Greenert, and uh, I see Tim Keating's on here. He was the big paycom, but uh, we all were in sync together, and we were in sync as well with our political folks. I see uh, that uh, Ambassador Jim Zumwalt is uh, is on the net, and he was the he was a key player uh, in uh, the embassy in Japan while I was there, and also he was the charge d'affaires, so he was the ambassador when Admiral Schieffer. Uh, went home uh, and uh, Jim assumed the uh, Charge Affairs uh, job uh, at the time. But uh, all those, all those uh, people, the political and the military have to get together. And that's the answer uh, for your India, uh, Indian Navy question. But start at the top, go with the Chiefs of Naval Operation. And uh, if you need help, get uh, Admiral Arun Prakash at XCNO from India to uh, lay lay on heavy uh, with Admiral Gilday uh, in Washington D.C. as our CNO, and we can start from there and and, and go go wherever we want to go. Over. Thank you very much, Dr. Hikotani. Um, just to add two things. One, if you're talking about top down, I think it was very important that Prime Minister Abe interest in India and bringing it into India and was very important in his whole concept of the free and open Indo Pacific and the speeches he made in India were very important. So that I think hopefully will be continued on to the Suga administration. Um, secondly, I think for the Quad for India, Australia, Japan, and the US, probably the speed of progress and the different relationship, whether it's US, India, India, Japan, is going to be somewhat different in nature. So although the top-down approach and putting bringing people together is very important, I think it's important to be accommodative of the level of differences in the different relationship, the bilateral or the trilateral part of the relationship to be pragmatic about the approach might be more constructive going forward than to try to be on the same lockstep each, each way forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, if I may, uh, I'd like to ask one last uh, quick question. Uh, we have a, a, a new political leadership uh, in Tokyo as well as uh, in Washington. And uh, uh, major players in Tokyo are mostly uh, carried over from uh, Abe administration. Uh, having said that, uh, uh, we are uh, uh, meeting a, a whole new set of uh, 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 policy makers uh, uh, starting from the president in Washington. And Tokyo has been uh, obviously paying lots of attention to uh, uh, new appointments. And uh, uh, if I may, uh, 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 I wonder if you, uh, 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 Riyad Kelly, uh, if you know uh, Secretary Austin. Unfortunately, sir, no, I don't. <laughs> I know him by reputation, uh, great leader, uh, and uh, certainly has had um, you know, command at every level and has really worked difficult, difficult, difficult issues in the central command. Uh, tremendously experienced uh, leader and a great human being from what I understand. I don't think there's going to be any uh, separation uh, from uh, our Secretary of Defense. Uh, and, and, you know, to, to Dr. Tani's uh, point as well, uh, that civilian leadership of the military, boy, it's key. And some people say, well, Austin hasn't been out of the, uh, the army for very long. Uh, well, Congress approved uh, him to go into the position. So he's got it. He understands and, and he can make things happen uh, and, and he will. But the, if 
where there's a will, there's a way. If the political leaders of our countries, whether it's Japan and the U.S. or or uh, the U.S. and India and Japan and Australia and you pick your other countries, if the leaders of the nations, all civilian-led, uh, right, uh, are are saying to their military folks, "Hey, get going, do this," the military is going to salute and say, "Aye, aye, we got it. we we'll, you know, let us run with that ball." And uh, so that that leadership from the top really, really counts. But I. I think uh, I've got great confidence in uh, General Austin uh, from uh, what I know of his reputation. And again, sorry, I've never uh, met the person, uh, but uh, but a good man, great man. Well, Rio Admiral Kelly, uh, you have served uh, uh, on U.S. Navy for 36 years and contributed a lot uh, uh, from uh, military uh, uh, Korea to uh, U.S.-Japan relationship. Now you're playing a major role uh, in the grassroots uh, uh, um, sector as a president of uh, John Manjiro uh, uh, Center for International uh, Cooperation. And I uh, wish you uh, good luck and hope that uh, you would come back and uh, uh, talk to us. And Dr. Hikotani, uh, thank you very much for uh, joining us at this uh, very important time that uh, uh, we are facing uh, uh, new challenges in Asia with the two uh, 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 political leadership in Tokyo and Washington. I really appreciate you taking time and be, part, uh, be, be with us today. So thank you very much for everybody uh, attending uh, uh, this event. And a special thanks to Admiral Koda. Uh, it's uh, past 3 a.m. and you can go to bed now. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Bye-bye.